I just uh, returned last night from a holiday in the Loire Valley. Uh, last two weeks, uh, wall-to-wall sunshine, a uh, nice little place uh, near a vineyard with a, its own swimming pool, a converted farmhouse, Jeet. Uh, really nice. Are you feeling jealous at all? I was trying to provoke some jealousy because that's our theme uh, this evening. And uh, here in 1 Samuel 18, we're going to have to confront jealousy. How do we define jealousy? What, what is jealousy anyway? What causes jealousy? Uh, why is jealousy a problem? Well, of course, famously, as the title of the sermon this evening uh, reminds us, these words from Shakespeare describe jealousy as the green-eyed monster from the play Othello. But is jealousy always a bad thing? If you think it is, you have a problem in the Bible when within a few chapters we read that God is a jealous God. So jealousy can't always be bad. Presumably, like anger, there can be good and bad anger. It depends. So when God is described as jealous, what does it highlight? What does it mean for God to be a jealous God? It must highlight the faithfulness of God's love, that God is a jealous God. God will not accept unfaithfulness or idolatry. Not because he's unloving, but because he is loving. So in that sense, God is a jealous God. He accepts no rivals. He accepts no compromise in the love he has for his people or the love he expects of his people for him. Now, what we mean by jealousy in our theme this evening is different. Perhaps it's better tonight to use the word envy. It means that we want what others have and we despise them because of it. It isn't so much about our faithfulness, it's about our lust. It's about the ambitions that we have that would push others out of the way. And that kind of jealousy, as we're going to see this evening, is deeply destructive. The Hebrew word from which our, our word jealousy comes, from the, the word that's translated here, jealousy comes, the Hebrew word, the, the root, means something like redness, going red. Now, we go red for all sorts of reasons. We go red out of embarrassment, uh, anger, sun, catching the sun, which is what I've been doing in the Loire. Uh, we go red for romance, of course, love. Well, we also go red out of jealousy. That's just the blood going to the cheeks. But why do we say jealousy is green? Why do we associate jealousy with greenness? Why is it a green-eyed monster? Why do we always associate the color green with being jealous. Well, you know, there's a biblical reason. There is a biblical reason for associating greenness with jealousy. We're going to see that being revealed in this story tonight. But it's there in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. You don't need to turn to it, but Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy rots the bones. What the ancients knew is that jealousy is like a sickness. And that's why it's described as green. It's a sickness in the body. It causes queasiness. It causes unhappiness. It causes us to be unsettled with what we've got. It causes us to be miserable with other people. It's like a rot in the bones. It causes a restlessness and a distrust of other people. And that's why envy is associated with greenness, with sickness. And that sickness can take us to places we never intended to go. What starts as just a, an envious thought of someone else, just a jealous thought of somebody else in our church family, can take us to places we never intended to go. And that's going to be the warning that we learn in this story of Saul this evening. His jealousy carries him far, far further than he ever intended to go. So let's follow it through together. If you've got it there in front of you, that would be really helpful. The first thing we come across is Saul's anger in verses 1 to 9. Saul's anger. So the background to the story I already mentioned, it's David killing Goliath. One of the most famous stories in the Bible. David, maybe only a teenager... He's returned from killing Goliath, you know, the giant Philistine. 
It's his first success on the public stage. And these opening verses suggest that everything is going to go well for David. We notice this friendship that forms with King Saul's son, Prince Jonathan. Verse 3, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. There's a beautiful friendship between Jonathan and David that's going to be important in later chapters. So we need to, to know about that friendship. But right now, we just need to notice the contrast between Jonathan's response to David and Saul. What does Jonathan do? He loves David. He feels at one with David. And in verse 4, he gives him his close possessions. His sword, his tunic, his bow, his belt. It's as if Jonathan knows that God is with David and he's not going to treat David as a rival. This covenant he makes with David, it's a way of saying, you know, David, I trust you. I trust you and I submit to you. If you're God's man, then I submit to you. You be king, not me, is ultimately what this covenant will lead to. So David has arrived on the public stage. He's only a teenager, but he's proved himself in combat. He's earned a close friendship with the king's son, and he's given high command in the king's army. In verse 5, look how well it goes. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. You know, it's just getting better and better for David. He's a success at whatever he does. It's what we call the Midas touch. All the troops like him. His popularity is growing. The more people get to know him, the more they like him. He's young, he's strong, he's popular, he's charismatic, he's successful. I mean, some of us, we just feel, well, we worry when people get to know us because they may like us at a distance, but we worry deep down because we think the more they get to know us, the less they're going to like us. The more responsibility we're given, the more likely we are to fail. But not David. The more people get to see him at work, the more they love him and like him. And then look what the women think of him. Verse 6. The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with tambourines and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. You know, to top it all, David is the theme of the number one hit song in Israel. And all the women are singing this song. David is unpopular with just one man. All this success makes Saul angry. The sadness behind this story is that David has done nothing to harm Saul. He's not said anything against him. The women's songs, they exaggerated anyway. David's crime is to be this all-round hero for the people. And so verse 8 Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Saul is being eclipsed by David. He's in the shadow of this young man. And he doesn't like it there. Now look, rationally, this doesn't make any sense, what we're reading tonight. Saul, actually, is still being complimented in the song. He's not being you know, dishonoured in the song. He's still being complimented. And all the successes of David are to Saul's benefit anyway. David's success is only because God's blessing is upon him. We learn that in the, the encounter with Goliath. It's only because of God being with David that David had any hope of bringing Goliath down. So looking at it rationally, Saul should celebrate David's success. It's in his interests. But you and I know full well that we don't see things rationally when envy creeps in. That's our problem. Uh, we read in Proverbs, so I read to you from Proverbs chapter 14, envy rots the bones, but you could add to that, envy corrupts the eyes. We don't see straight. We don't see things the way they are. It's revealed then, verse 9. And from that time on, Saul kept 
a close eye on David. If you've got the older NIV, a jealous eye on David. It's literally a close eye, but it implies a jealous eye on David. What everyone else sees as a wonderful reason for celebration, Saul sees as a reason for anger. And then a sequence begins in verse 9. A sequence begins with that thought in verse 9 that will eventually plunge Israel into civil war. And it'll take Saul to an early grave. You can trace through this story how jealousy affects Saul's thinking and his actions and his ambition. This anger that starts in the heart, this envy that begins in the heart, it leads to a fit of rage. And it twists Saul's ambitions. And it will ultimately prove the undoing of many in Israel. So Saul's anger is being stirred. And what we next meet with in verses 10 to 11 is Saul's violence. This, this next scene, it takes place in Saul's house. We, we would consider that a palace, but you shouldn't think of a big ornate palace. It's probably like a large kind of farmhouse that's his headquarters. He has his servants there, perhaps a, a security force of troops, and there's David playing on the lyre. And what's Saul doing? He's prophesying, we read. Now, I know this raises some interesting questions for us. We're not going to be able to tackle all this tonight. But we read that an evil spirit is influencing Saul. Now, presumably that means the prophesying that Saul is involved in is false prophecy. Uh, to prophecy means to speak forth God's word, to tell out what God has to say. So you prophesy when you speak out God's word, when you deliver God's wisdom and God's word. Now, if Saul is prophesying under the influence of an evil spirit, you have to assume and imagine he's saying all sorts of perhaps blasphemous and certainly false things. But the origins of the evil spirit clearly trouble us. Look at verse 10. The next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. Now, it would be a much easier sermon if we just read that the evil spirit came from the devil. We would be okay with that, but we're told it comes from God. Now, if the evil spirit had come from the devil, we wouldn't particularly have a problem. But what would it mean that the evil spirit has come from God? Now, I'm not going to get into all of the background to demonology tonight, but the answer must surely be, the simple answer must surely be, that we are reminded that God is in control of this situation. And actually, he's not only in control in 1 Samuel chapter 18, but he's in control in every chapter of the Bible and in every chapter of your life too. The book of Job tells us that the devil can't do anything without God's sovereign permission. And in this world of mystery and evil and suffering, we don't know why these things happen, but we do know that God is still in control. God hasn't taken his hands off the steering wheel. Our lives aren't out of control. There is behind it all the sovereign hand of God. And so God is in control even in this situation. We know Saul has chosen a path of jealousy. We already read that in verse 9. He's opened his heart, if you like, to the wrong thing. And now God permits him to follow that path and the evil spirit is part of God's judgment on Saul. God allows, God permits, God sends this evil spirit. So on this day, the result of Saul's envy is anger. And his anger spills over into violence. This is not some kind of considered attempt to kill David. I mean, if it had been a considered attempt, he could have done it better, I think. It's kind of a strange situation, actually. He hurls the spear... Uh, saying he's going to pin David to the wall. But then we read right at the end of verse 11, David eluded him twice. So he had to pick it up and throw it again. It's an outburst of violent anger. It's as if Saul was sitting there, stewing over his mind how he felt about this young upstart, and then he lashes out with the spear. You may not have thrown a spear at anyone, but you know this experience. You try and bottle up those feelings you have but they spill out. You can't do it. If you nurse those feelings of envy, if you nurse those bitter feelings against other people, if you don't deal with them, if they are there 
rotting your bones, festering inside. One day they spill out, they burst out. One of the saddest ways that happens, and we have to deal with it in pastoral ministry time and again, is that that anger can spill out and be directed towards completely innocent, uh, unintended people. Uh, there can be a situation where perhaps the anger builds up because of something that's happening in your work with your colleagues or at college. And you come home and it spills out with your family. Perhaps your, your spouse or your children suffer as a result. Because of that, that anger inside you're not dealing with, others end up getting hurt. There's an expression in the computer world, I understand, garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage data in, garbage information will come out the other end. And if you put garbage into your life, garbage comes out again. If we allow those kinds of feelings to rot our bones inevitably, they're going to go public. They're going to make themselves known. And that's what happens in this situation. Saul's envy has led him to violence, an outburst of violence. And then it turns in verse 12 to fear. So he moved from anger to violence to fear. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. People who get angry very easily are usually people who are very afraid. You know, real strength lies in taming our emotions. Real strength lies in taking control of your emotions and your lusts and your passions, dealing with them. That's real strength. Giving into them, allowing them to fester is weakness. And weakness certainly leads to fear. Raises a, a question, I suppose, for this man Saul. What is he afraid of? What exactly is Saul afraid of in this chapter? Is he afraid for the nation of Israel? Is he afraid for the future of the nation of Israel? Is he afraid that the nation of Israel might not build on its successes and become a great nation? Is he afraid that maybe God's glory could be diminished by this young upstart? Is he afraid that maybe God's laws will be ignored? Because people will go after this popular young hero. Well, not at all, obviously. Saul is not jealous for the honor of God. He's just afraid that he's now going to be shunted into a siding. All that Saul is afraid of is his own position. And so from here on, from verse 12 onwards, the word fear appears very frequently in association with Saul. Saul is Saul the afraid. He's going to be acting out of fear time and again. Now, rationally, this is so sad. Rationally, this is so sad. Because this is a point at which Israel can achieve so much. Uh, verse 14. In everything he did, that's David, in everything he did, David had great success because the Lord was with him. That is good news. That should be a cause for celebration. Saul's right-hand man is Mr. Successful. But instead, Saul's reaction becomes his habit. It becomes ingrained. Verse 15, when Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. Jealousy's like that. It's self-destructive. It doesn't work in your own interests. It works against you. You know, Saul is more afraid of David than he is of the Philistines. That's what we learn here. And jealousy is like that. We lose perspective completely on who our true friends are and who the real enemy is. Do you know the number one enemy to the work of God? Do you know the number one enemy to the church here, right now? Church here, Lansdowne Baptist Chapel. It's the same number one enemy as we have at Old Holt Chapel. And it's not national governments. When Chairman Mao in China tried to abolish the church and persecute Christians and make church going illegal, what did he achieve? 50, 60 years on, the church in China has grown. There are regions of China where it's estimated that 10% of the population are evangelical Christians. China's a vast nation. 10% in some of those regions means there is a significant number of born-again evangelical Chinese believers. 
National governments aren't our number one threat. Other religions aren't our number one threat. Nor are secular ideologies. Nor is Richard Dawkins. None of those will destroy churches. History proves it time and again. None of those are enemy number one. You know, enemy number one of the church of God is here tonight. And I can reveal it tonight. It's me and it's you. It's not just me. It's me and you. The church, historically, time and again, has been destroyed from the inside. Churches divide and split and fight. It's as if for some reason God has given us a self-destruct button and too often we choose to press it. You know, unless the issue is fundamental gospel doctrine, I do not see a reason why Christians should fall out with each other. But if you do, if you let personality become important, envy, traditions, bitterness, if you let those things creep into church family life, you might as well be writing the church's death warrant. The church is destroyed from the inside. We tear ourselves apart. The outside world doesn't do it. And that's what's happening here. Saul has allowed this envy to get the better of him. And now he sees things in this poison light, in the light of green envy. That leads me to a final point tonight. It's Saul's ambition. It started with envy, jealousy. There was anger. It led to violence. He's now afraid. And I want to finish by thinking about Saul's ambition. It's really from verse 17 right to the end of the chapter, but I'm only going to summarize these final parts of the story. You see, the remainder of the chapter is consumed by an elaborate plan. Saul is supposed to be running a country. Saul is supposed to be holding together all the tribes of Israel. Saul is supposed to be confronting the Philistines and building the kingdom of God. Saul is supposed to be preserving the law of God for the people of God. And what is he doing? For half a chapter of the Bible now, we are going to be engrossed in the details of a minute plan to get David killed. That's what Saul is consumed by. This is now Saul's ambition. This is what all his energy is being poured into. Envy is like that. It consumes our energy. Our, our eyes are taken off what we're supposed to be doing and we pour all our resources into the wrong thing. And that is Saul from verse 17 to 30. Just let me uh, show you what happens. Verse 17. Don't worry, I won't go into detail about the foreskins bit. Verse 17, Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter Merab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. That sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds like Saul's had a change of heart. What a lovely offer to David. Sounds like David's entered Saul's good books with the offer in verse 17. But the writer lets you know what Saul is really planning. What Saul is really planning, end of verse 17, Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. He's going to do it by getting David to fight more and more battles. He will push David harder and harder and harder because he knows the odds are against him. Warfare has always been a cruel thing. The horrors of war. But ancient warfare... When you, uh, if you read my book, actually, I'll go into a little bit of detail on this. Uh, sorry, a little uh, plug there. Ancient warfare, it's incredible, the, the, the barbarity of ancient warfare. And when you take away all the possibilities of medication and treatment and painkillers, the battlefield was a savage place in the ancient world. The iron sword, the slice of the axe, fractured skulls and missing limbs. The, the battlefield was a terrible place. And the odds were always against you. The more often you went into the battlefield... There was a strong chance you would never come back. Wasn't that being a great fighter or not a great fighter? The chances were you would never come back because of some stray arrow or a spear. Well, the odds are against David surviving if Saul pushes him more and more into battle. Well, David won't marry Merab, and you might wonder why Mer marrying Merab has anything to do with fighting, but you're going to see in a moment. David won't marry Merab. It would have only been a political marriage anyway. And uh, he's not going to agree to it. He just uh, points out his own poverty of background. But then Saul hears, he gets wind, that there is a love interest going on between David and another daughter, Michal. 
And so Saul offers David Michal, this other daughter. And David agrees, because this is someone he does love, and she loves him. And this reveals Saul's real plan. Now, in order to marry in the ancient world, you had to pay a bride price. The reason why you did this is it showed you were really committed to the woman you were marrying. You had to pay. You helped pay off some of the economic loss the family would experience. And it meant that you weren't just idly taking someone on, you'd then toss away. You would pay a bride price, and it would mean that you were serious. So David knows there's going to be a bride price involved. He's expecting it to be financial. That's perhaps why I didn't want to marry Merab. There might have been a high price tag involved. But he's willing to pay the price for Michal. But he gets a surprise when he gets the bill. The bill is not a large financial sum. It's 100 Philistine foreskins. Now, of course, the point about it, this rather macabre physical evidence he has to produce, is that David's going to go go into a lot of combat to produce the results. Saul expects the price, the bride price, to be the death of David. But God's blessing ensures David's success. David is successful. He brings back the bride price. He's destroyed many Philistine lives. He's done the job, so he gets the woman. And verse 28, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David, and his daughter Michal loved David, Saul thought, what a wonderful thing, my empire is secure. No. If you're following in the Bible, verse 29, no. Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. And that is the final statement of Saul's ambition. That's what Saul's ambition has come to. He will be an enemy of David for the rest of his days. His passion, his thinking, his sleepless nights, they will all be consumed by this one quest to destroy David. What a sad, sad ending for Saul's great aspirations. His ambition has simply become, become the ambition of the enemy to destroy the work of God. Jealousy has taken him far away from where he was ever supposed to be. And jealousy can do the same for us. See, a division runs through this passage tonight. And this is where I want to close. A division runs through this passage between those who are for David and those who are opposed. Jonathan represents the one who sees in David the hand of God and submits. Saul represents the one who sees only a reason for envy and opposition. And it raises the question, whose side are we on? We have to make our decision too. We have to choose sides. What ambition do we have in life? What are we really living for? If we are on the Lord's side, and if that's more than a song, if we're on the Lord's side, that governs our ambitions. We live our lives to want to bring glory to God. We are jealous for the Lord's will. We live for him. And if we're opposed to the Lord, it'll be demonstrated by the petty rivalries and jealousies and envies that will fuel our ambition. Just turn in closing to Philippians chapter 1. Just a, a final reference from the New Testament. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15. See, in church life, jealousy can emerge for all sorts of reasons. In our relationships with each other. And our attitudes to church direction, ministry. And look at what Paul reveals of his heart and ambition. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15. Paul, who suffered greatly at the hands of rivals, Paul said this about them in verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. That's the ambition and the heart of the apostle, 
That's the ambition and the heart of the Christian life. And that is the solution to jealousy. It is, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, the love that hopes all things, that thinks the best of other people, that wants the best for other people. That's the cure for jealousy and for envy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, please forgive us that in our hearts we do nurture jealousy and envy. And Lord, thank you for the warning that we see written large in the life of Saul. Thank you for the warning we can see as the direction that jealousy takes leads to a place we know we don't want to be. Forgive us, Lord, that we have nursed selfish ambitions. Forgive us for the attitudes we've allowed to fester in our hearts Lord, please, would you cleanse us through your Holy Spirit? Would you wash it all away through the perfect love of our Redeemer? May we remember again that attitude of Christ Jesus. May we be filled again with the heart of love for others, that we would put them first. And if jealousy has a place, may it only be a zeal for the word of God and for the gospel. Lord, thank you for the love that excels. Thank you for the love of our Redeemer. Please, through your spirit, make us less like the old Saul and more like our King Jesus. Amen.